Hello and welcome to the Australian Institute for International Affairs, the ACT branch. My name is Bradley Innes and I'm a counsellor of the ACT branch. Tonight we turn, we turn to an important issue for one of Australia's nearby neighbours. The upcoming presidential election for the Philippines and who may potentially lead the nation for the next six years. The election is scheduled for the 9th of May and so far the campaign is hotly contested between running, pair, running front running pair Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. and Sarah Duterte, and second place Lenny Robredo and Francis Kiko Paganinan. Controversially, Bong Bong is, a, is the only son of former dictator Ferdinand Marcos, who ruled the Philippines from 1972 until 1986, when he was ousted by the popular people power movement. And Sarah Duterte is the daughter of a retiring president, Rodrigo Duterte, who has been responsible for controversial policies during his administration, including the war on drugs. Interestingly, at this stage of the campaign, opinion polls place Bong Pong and Sarah 36 points in front of the Lenny Kiko team. However, tonight, to help us understand this complex issue, we have joined by Professor Paul Hutchcroft from the Department of Politics and Social Change at the ANU. Having taught me personally at the ANU and also speaking previously here in 2019, I know Paul to be an eminent scholar of comparative and Southeast Asian politics who has written extensively on the Philippines political and politics of the economy. From 2009 to 2013, Paul was a founding director of the ANU School of International Politics and Strategic Studies, since renamed the Coral Bell School of the Asia Pacific Affairs. Between 2013 and 2017, Paul was based in the Philippines as lead government specialist with the Australian Aid Program. And from 2018 to 2021, he headed up ANU's DFAD funding project on supporting the rules-based order in Southeast Asia. His current research interests include involvement in Australian Research Council project on urban politics in Southeast Asia. He is a co-author of the upcoming book, Mobilizing for the Election, Elections, Patronage and Political Machines in Southeast Asia. Therefore, without further ado, please take it away, Paul. Great. Thank you very much, Bradley, for that kind introduction. And uh, always good to see a, a former student going on to uh, doing uh, very interesting things. Uh, so um, I uh, will be talking today about the um, prospects of the uh, two leading candidates in the Philippines, uh, the son of Ferdinand Marcos, uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., known as Bong Bong, and uh, Vice President Lenny Robredo. Uh, so um, it's a bit uh, amazing that for me, as someone who's been watching the Philippines for something like 40 years, uh, that uh, Marcos, uh, actually, the son of Marcos, may actually be coming back into power. But uh, that's certainly the way it uh, the way it looks. So uh, today I'm going to be looking first of all broadly at what's at stake in the 2022 uh, elections. I'll give a, a little bit of uh, polling data for you. Um, then I will be um, giving you a bit of background on the electoral rules of the game in the Philippines, some dif distinctive features of how. Um, uh, the president and others are elected. Um, then I'm going to go back in time and look at some wild twists and turns of late 2021, uh, in which there was a lot of jockeying as to who was going to be on the uh, ticket. And as you can see, I'll be looking at how President Duterte squandered his opportunity to play a decisive role in choosing the next president. Uh, and then uh, as already advertised, I'll be looking at uh, dynamics and assessing the prospects of the two major candidates. So um, first of all, uh, the uh, Philippines has a very large electorate coming into this election, uh, 67.5 million registered voters. Uh, and this is very important. 56% are between 18 to 41. What does that mean? Many of them 
do not remember Ferdinand Marco Sr. Uh, and how he was deposed uh, along with his wife in 1986. Um, there's a very daunting number of posts uh, at stake. Um, the Americans were very good at coming in the Philippines and setting up elections, not so good at setting up uh, strong government structures and the bureaucracy and all, but really good at the election. So uh, we have 18,000 posts across uh, different levels. Half of the members of the Senate are elected every three years to six year terms, 360 members of the House of Representatives, a slew of uh, mayors and of, of governors and mayors across provinces, cities and towns. Um, a, a bunch of provincial councilors, and this is where the numbers really go up, uh, 13,500 city and town councilors. So that's the big picture. But what we'll be talking about today uh, is the uh, um, who's running for the key people who are standing for the, the presidency. You can see who's got all the glitz here, um, the uh, Bong Bong Marcos and Sarah Duterte, um, the red and green colors that they have. Uh, and then um, to the right there is Vice President uh, Lenny Robredo and um, her vice presidential candidate, Kiko Pangalinan, um, whom uh, Bradley mentioned earlier. Now, Kiko is really not so important for you to remember, aside from the fact that he's a senator and and he's the husband of a very famous movie star. So uh, he's the wife of Sharon Cuneta. That's how he is known uh, to the uh, electorate. Uh, then we have the mayor of Manila, who's really been a rising uh, presence on the uh, national political stage. And then to the left, uh, left-hand corner uh, bottom, who is that to the, to, on, on the left-hand side? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Manny Pacquiao, uh, I was giving it a talk uh, um, uh, not long ago, and my Australian audience didn't know who Manny Pacquiao was. I said, pound for pound, uh, the best boxer in the world in his day. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's a senator now, and he's running for uh, president. Then we have a couple senators running together. And then uh, bottom right, uh, not significant in terms of numbers, but I put them up there because they're unusual in that they have a very well-developed platform. Uh, this is Leody de Guzman and Walden Bellio. Walden Bellio, former um, uh, congressman, um, a very important uh, public intellectual uh, in the Philippines. Uh, and uh, they have a, they're from the soft left and they have a, uh, they're distinguished by the fact that they have a very well-developed um, platform. Um, so just looking at the polling data, I want to give this as a sna snapshot, and we'll come back to some of this. You can see that um, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., Bong Bong Marcos, has doing, been doing very well uh, since the end of, of last year. Um, Lenny Robredo, the vice president, has um, uh, had some dips, but she's she's got the momentum right now, but momentum at 32% behind um, uh, the uh, leading contender. Then we have the mayor of Manila and uh, the boxer, uh, Manny Pacquiao, and the former senator before that, former police director, um, uh, all just really struggling to get uh, traction. And then the one with the platform, uh, quite negligible. Uh, then um, uh, if we can move on to the next slide, I'm going to highlight some um, important features of how elections are done in the Philippines. First of all, the president and the vice president are elected separately. So this creates a system in which and this is uh, often realized, um, the top two officials of the land come from different political parties. It's a very unusual system. Uh, from what I know, one of the few other places that have this uh, odd and I would say dysfunctional system is Texas say no more. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, since the promulgation of the uh, Constitution in 87, uh, there's only one instance of president and vice president uh, actually winning office together. Next, second, second feature. Victory comes from a mere plurality, um, maybe just one at a time, um, uh, Josie. Uh, victory comes from a mere plurality, it doesn't require a majority. Uh, so exhibit A here is uh, Fidel Ramos, a former general uh, who was a very effective president actually, but he only won office with 23.6% of the vote in 1992. 
Um, other candidates at that point, at that point, incidentally, included Imelda Marcos and a former uh, Marcos crony. And knowing that it is possible to win by such a small plurality encourages others to come in to the fray. Um, so it uh, leads to um, a, a lot of uh, candidates overall. And contrast this with a two-round system that we know in Indonesia and that we're seeing right now in France. So uh, neither Emmanuel Macron or Marine Le Pen won the 50%. So they go into a second round. And in that system, potential candidates are at least theoretically deterred from coming into it if they don't think that they have a real chance at uh, eventually garnering a uh, majority of the seats. The third thing I want to highlight is that presidents are limited to a single term, a one six-year term of office. Uh, and this discourages incumbents from investing in party building. According to a, a, a colleague, co-author of mine, Alan Hicken from the University of Michigan, these term limits, particularly at the top of the ticket for the presidency, have contributed to less party discipline, more factionalism, and to a larger number of short-lived political parties. Parties. Similar to South Korea, which has a one-term presidency. Uh, and if uh, uh, scholars of South Korean politics sometimes say that they get confused by all the parties and all the um, uh, new parties that come, come and go over time, uh, the same is true with uh, those of us who watch Philippine parties. Some of these parties are just very short-term. Uh, I would be hard-pressed. I know I have it in my notes somewhere. What's the name of Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s party? It's just a completely insignificant vehicle, and frankly, it's sometimes just a, um, a waste of time except as a curiosity to figure out what these um, different parties are. Incidentally, Marcos and Duherte are running under separate parties. Uh, Lenny Robredo, uh, who is the president of the Liberal Party, has chosen not to run under the Liberal Party because it's been pilloried so heavily by um, the Duterte social media through the years that she's running as an independent. If the Liberal Party was yellow, she said, I'm pink this year. So uh, all of this is just uh, very interesting branding that goes on. Um, I, we have um, put together a book on the um, need for electoral system redesign in the Philippines if there is a goal of building stronger uh, political parties. But here in the next slide uh, is, I, I think, the best description of Philippine political parties by uh, Nathan Kimpo, an ANU PhD, uh, now in, in Japan, far from being stable programmatic parties, uh, entities, Philippine political parties have, been, have proved to be not much more than convenient vehicles of patronage that can be set up, merged with others, split, resurrected, regurgitated, reconstituted, renamed, repackaged, recycled, or flushed down the toilet at any time. So keep this in mind when we're talking about Philippine political parties. This encapsulates uh, the situation. So then, uh, Families remain the most important unit of political contention. Yesterday's allies can be today's uh, rivals. And um, I've got some pictures coming up. Two former presidents that used to be rivals uh, are now um, uh, allies. Uh, now, this isn't to say that possibilities are endless, but um, as um, uh, uh, the uh, great Southeast Asian scholar, um, scholar of Southeast Asian politics, Benedict Anderson said, there uh, can be a major reshuffling in this kaleidoscope of oligarchic power, uh, which describes it quite well. Election results are commonly assessed not on the performance of parties, but on the performance of families. So keep this in mind as we're looking at uh, some of the uh, dynamics moving forward. So next uh, section, I want to look at how Duterte squandered his opportunity to play a decisive role. This is in late 2021. Uh, and why does he care about the election? Well, in this particular case, I was talking with someone about this earlier, uh, he um, wants to make sure that he's not going to be arrested for corruption or most importantly for the thousands of killings that have come about in his so-called drug war. And here we have um, uh, Duterte with his famous lists and he would have these lists of uh, local politicians that he would be accusing of being narco politicians. Uh, some two dozen uh, local officials uh, have been uh, killed um, uh, during his term. And the, a very famous uh, photograph of a woman cradling the um, body of her uh, recently um, 
uh, killed partner uh, on the streets of Manila uh, early in the uh, drug war. So what is Duterte scared of? First of all, nothing makes his blood boil more than mention of the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, but he also needs to worry about what a future administration uh, might do, um, particularly if it, that administration is not uh, allied um, with him. Um, he doesn't want to emulate two predecessors, Joseph Estrada, president from 98 to 2001, or Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, president from 2001 to 2010, who were incarcerated on corruption charges after leaving the palace. So what did he want to do? This is looking back uh, in um, uh, uh, 2021, who could be more rel re reliably of the same mold than his daughter, shown on the left there, um, the mayor of his home city, Davao, in Mindanao, Sarah Duterte Carpio, nicknamed Duterte uh, in the campaign, or his trusted consigliere, who was a special assistant, who he got put into the Senate in the 2019 um, uh, campaign. And he did quite well just on the basis of the endorsement from Duterte. Now, here, here they are in Moscow. This is when they were getting along, and they're doing the famous uh, Duterte uh, fist bump. But those two don't get along at all anymore. There was a great deal of contention uh, that came forth uh, quite openly in the um, 2020 uh, lead up to 2021. So if Duterte wanted to have his daughter ideally as the next president, unfortunately, something got in the way, a family spat, very badly timed family spat. So that came out in the open by August. Uh, here they are in um, uh, happier times. I think that's in um, uh, Tokyo. And um, then uh, they're not getting along so well uh, later. Um, I wish I could be a fly in the house of the Duterte home to understand the dynamics. I won't speculate on why they're not getting along. Um, but as so is, as is so often the case in family disputes, there was a third party. Who is that third party? Bong Bong Marcos, who along with his sister, Aimee, are really courting Sarah to try to come over to their camp. The daddy wants Sarah to be at the top of the ticket. They want to bring her in at, uh, at the vice presidential level. So they first court her and then um, they seal the deal in November. Now they don't really get married. They are sponsors at a wedding of a politician in Cavite and that in uh, November, that's where they uh, uh, work out the deal. Now, Papa Duterte does not like this at all. And so in the middle of November, right after Sarah and Bong Bong had um, uh, teamed up together, he launched a thinly veiled tirade, tirade against a man that everyone knew was none other than Bong Bong Marcos. He attacked him for not only being a weak leader, but a spoiled child only son who was also a cocaine addict. Those rumors of cocaine addict have been around um, quite a while, but he put it right out there in the public. And in a further lament, um, speaking in an interview and speaking about his daughter, why, but not to her, why would you settle for vice president for heaven's sakes when you are the uh, head of the pack? He also accused, this is quite remarkable, both Marcos and his arch rival, Lenny Robredo, of being pro-communist. So he's uh, He's really clutching at straws uh, on this one. Um, so what's the result to get to the end of the story? For the first time in, uh, any, any, in political memory, the incumbent president has no anointed candidate uh, going into the election. So the Supremo isn't looking very supreme, but I also want to point out he remains very popular in the um, uh, surveys. Uh, at this point, he has yet to endorse a presidential candidate, um, but he seemingly adjusted to his daughter's alliance with the Marcoses, his supposed ruling party that's not a very um, important uh, institution, PDP Laban, uh, has come out and endorsed Bong Bong Marcos. And it's really hard to know, but likely he would see Marcos as his salvation from um, prosecution uh, and come to accept a subsidiary position. But you know, you really never know what Duterte says when he gets behind a podium at one of his midnight press conferences. Uh, and uh, he gets very, very loquacious um, uh, some, uh, I'll, I'll just say he gets loquacious. Uh, and he, uh, 
um, uh, who knows? Um, he could say something that um, uh, surprises us. Uh, from his standpoint, he can hope that uh, hope that a future uh, president, Bong Bong Marcos, and uh, the the family there is shown visiting the uh, uh, palace in 2019. So he can go hope that a future president, Bong Bong, would have a stronger memory for all that Duterte did to rehabilitate the family. Most importantly, up here on the right uh, upper right of this slide, when he allowed. Ferdinand Marcos to be buried in the Hero Cemetery. So he hopes he'll remember that more than what he said back in November about the um, weakness, fondness for cocaine and communist uh, sympathies. So let's uh, move on into the final part of the talk and that's to look at current electoral dynamics. Again, focusing on these top two candidates most of all. So is the Alliance between Bong Bong Marcos and Sarah Duterte, a uh, juggernaut. One must observe that it does seem to be an unbeatable combination of bailiwicks. Remember what I said about the importance of families more than parties. So we're analyzing things here in terms of, of families. He's got, of course, the Marcoses who have a lot of support in the north, the Dutertes who have a lot of support in the Visayas, the middle central um, part of the country, as well as Mindanao in the south. Former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, who is uh, uh, right here in, in this picture, as well as here, who's very strong in central. Central Luzon, north of Manila. The Estradas, um, former President Estrada right here, uh, who has his own political machine in part of Metro Manila. Um, the Garcias of Cebu, uh, shown here, um, the most vote-rich province in the uh, country, uh, has come out very strongly for uh, Bong Bong and Sarah, uh, and uh, then the Romualdezes, which is the maiden name of Amelda. So her family has its own political machine in the eastern uh, Visayas. So you have all of these uh, very important bailiwicks that have come behind Bong Bong and Sarah, and uh, that could easily translate into an easy victory for Bong Bong. One more photo, I sorry, that I want to highlight here is uh, this one of Sarah Duterte and Aimee Marcos. I don't know what the female equivalent of a romance is, but it's going on here. They love to go out, uh, get their leather jackets on and, and uh, go out and ride motorcycles um, together. So um, he has all of these resources. The Marcuses um, uh, are known for kleptocracy uh, for some 10 billion that was stolen from the country. So they still have a lot of those resources. They're polling very strongly. So, okay, um, we, you've got all those bailiwicks, plus you've got um, the financial resources, plus very importantly, very well-tuned social media effort, effort that's been going on for many, many years now, which the, the Marcuses are trying to rehabilitate their image. Um, and uh, it's won over many voters, uh, particularly the young. If you look at the polling, it's the youth that are particularly strong for, um, for, for Marcos. Uh, and uh, Marcos, just I'll say as an aside, uh, has so much confidence that he wants to win this election and he may well win on the basis of YouTube and TikTok uh, without attending a single major presidential debate. He just doesn't feel a need to go into that um, because of the, the social media effort. I might also note that he's uh, gotten some big crowds um, as well uh, and some very important local uh, endorsements. One thing I'd, I'd, I'd point out too is that he has managed to do something that no other candidate has done since his father was deposed in 1986 and democratic structures returned to the Philippines, and that is to garner a majority in the polls. But I think we can still ask questions about how firm that support is. Um, it's notable that as recently as September 2021, he was uh, only polling 15% uh, versus 20 for Sarah, that's what upset the father. You're getting more, more uh, higher survey ratings than um, um, uh, Bong Bong, why did you give way to him? The mayor of Manila, 13, the boxer, Pacquiao, 12, and the vice president, way down at eight. So a question might be raised, has he peaked too early? Moving on then, this is what I was highlighting earlier. This is an article that goes back to 2019, but social media has been very, very effective part of rehabilitating the, the Marcos name. And it, it's there's two parts of it. One is to go back to what they now call 
They forget about the, the lost decade of the 1980s when the Philippine economy was just uh, completely well, well known as the, the sick man of, uh, sick person of, of Asia. Uh, they speak of the golden age of martial law and um, trot out the martial law hymns and all that sort of thing from the, from the 1970s. That's one part of the social media effort. The other is to build up this new generation. This is the son of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and his wife, Lisa Araneta Marcos. Araneta is a very um, uh, important family in, in the Philippines. So their son is, is one of their uh, key assets in social media. Uh, and uh, if you go on YouTube and you look for Bong Bong and um, um, San Sandro, the nickname of the, of the son, you get these kind of heartwarming talks between them where, you know, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the father, Bong Bong, will be reading these questions so how many girlfriends have you had? And um, uh, very, very sort of frivolous kinds of, of questions. Um, what kind of quality are you looking for in whoever you would marry? And then he says, oh, well, somebody like my mom and, you know, um, uh, all, all these sort of very uh, heartwarming kinds of things. And then the, the, the grandson speaks of his grandmother, Imelda. I remember when she came with big box of uh, big bags of chocolate. And remember, you weren't wanting me to eat chocolate. You, you get the idea, right? Very kind of frivolous things that is really softening the reputation of a family that um, for uh, many of the rest of us is known for uh, its human, uh, severe human rights abuses uh, and for uh, how it looted the country and, and such rampant uh, cronyism. So very, very effective. Uh, and this has been hammered on for a very long time. And then not to be forgotten, it's my own view that if in just in terms of um, uh, merit, uh, this would not be the son, the the uh, offspring that you would choose, uh, Bong Bong. His sister, Aimee, is a senator and a much more uh, diligent, shall we say, as well as um, uh, thoughtful uh, politician. So he's got these influences in the background. Of course, his, his mother, Amelda, that's what Amelda Marcos looks like um, these days. She's 92. Uh, and then the sister, Aimee, and then not to be forgotten, his wife, Lisa Araneta Marcos from a very important family. So um, uh, as recently explained in the Washington Post, uh, and this is well worth looking, looking up, after quoting a historian, Alfred W. McCoy, a former colleague of mine at the University, University of Wisconsin, who helped to expose the fake medals of, of Marcos uh, right uh, before the February 1986 election. After quoting this eminent expert uh, who has written all about the ravages of, of Marcos's a strong man rule, Regine Cabato proceeds with, and this is so true, as an expert, I find it painful to read, but it is so true. The opinions of experts, however, can be no match for 30 seconds of TikTok, such as in one video viewed more than 50,000 times where a toddler simply shouts, bring back Marcos. Uh, it drew over 800 commenters, most of whom replied with a similar sentiment. We'll bring him back, baby, they said for your future, okay? So you can see what kind of role that uh, issues and platforms are having in this election, bringing the Marcoses uh, uh, quite possibly back into the presidential um, palace. And what does it mean that the election outcome is of great international interest? Bong Bong Marcos has shown himself to be very close to China. He's ready to set aside the 2016 um, uh, a tribunal, um, uh, decision on the South China Sea. Uh, and there's a picture of uh, Philippine fishing boats with a Chinese vessel in the background and the uh, military uh, buildup in the South China Sea. Quite, quite clearly, um, China would be quite happy with a Marcos uh, victory. So let's move to the second place candidate, the one that's way down in the polls, but she is building up substantial uh, momentum, attracting very large and enthusiastic crowds, uh, even in areas she would not be expected to do all that well. Uh, and she's also getting some endorsements from local politicians. And this kind of goes against the grain a little bit because local politicians tend to want to know who's gonna win. They want to be with the bandwagon that is going to get into the presidential palace because that is how they're going to get patronage resources uh, after the elections. Many of her supporters are very angry at the pollsters. Uh, they don't find the results uh, credible. Um, I happen to disagree with them very strongly on, on that. Um, but 
Um, it is it is what it is. Uh, even if she is gaining uh, substantial momentum, the question is, does she have time in these, um, what, um, less than three weeks to catch up with Marcos? Uh, beyond her enthusiastic supporters, is she able to get enough voters? Or is there a kind of ceiling? There's been so much negative uh, attacks on her in social media that what if that you know she's not never going to go above thirty five percent because sixty five percent of the population just view her so negatively? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's worth raising. Uh, so she has all of these negatives coming back from six years of concerted attacks. She did defeat Ferdinand Marcos in the vice presidential race back in 2016. She was very effective in front of crowds. She had what her supporters called a high conversion rate, bringing people uh, over. Um, but it's not clear that she'll be able to do the same. One commentator, Richard Haydarian, says she needs three things. One, hope for some splits in the Marcos Duterte camp. You see some of those around uh, here and there. She needs the boxer, Pacquiao, to withdraw in her favor. And so happens that Manny Pacquiao and Lenny Robredo get along pretty well. They've done some sort of humanitarian work together. It's not impossible. I, I don't think any of the rest of the would, would fold in fa her favor, but it's not impossible that he might. Uh, and he also, she also needs continuous strong grassroots mobilization by her so-called Pink Brigade. What is the Pink Brigade? Moving on to the next thing. She, as I said, has, has moved away from the color yellow, which was so uh, denigrated by the uh, Duterte people, picked up uh, pink. And this is a rally that she recently had in Pampanga, north of Manila, in the territory of Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, who was supporting Marco. So it was quite extraordinary that she was getting these kinds of um, numbers. And there's another rally coming up in a few days in Cebu, where the governor and the um, mayor uh, are strongly for Bong Bong and Sarah. And we'll see whether she can do uh, a similar feat. She did one win in Cebu in 2016. Well, I'll go back just a little bit. So her slogan, uh, honest government, um, to lift um, uh, everyone's uh, lives. Uh, final slide here. Um, this one I, I put in uh, sort of as fun. This gets a sense of the, the, the viewpoint of a, a Manichaean battle on the part of those who do not want Marcos to come back in. So this is a little play on words in Tagalog. Uh, no, no one in the world has more genius for plays on words uh, than uh, Filipino. So uh, basically it says, uh, the dirty needs to be cleaned. It takes some liberties with uh, vowels, kind of a uh, uh, contra kiwi thing. Instead of the um, the uh, e's becoming eyes, the eyes are becoming e's. If you get what I'm saying. But uh, who, who's the dirty? Marcos Duterte, Macapagal, and Estrada, uh, and the clean uh, that is a play on uh, Lenny Robredo's name. Linisin uh, changed to Lenisin. Um, the dirty needs to be clean. So that's how uh, many of Robredo's supporters would view it. Uh, but certainly the moment, momentum is very much in favor of, well, no, she's building momentum. But uh, uh, if I had to predict, I would really see it very hard for um, uh, her to catch up with uh, with uh, Bongmo Marcos, but miracles happen. Uh, and um, there is a lot of questions, as I said, in terms of the, the solidity of his support and whether he might have peaked early. We'll see, um, we'll, we'll hopefully know the answer in three weeks. So that's it, thank you very much. I'm open to any questions at this point. Very good, um, it was very Reminiscent of my time in university, seeing uh, Paul back up on the podium there, in, waving his arm around in front of a uh, <laughs> in front of a in front of a screen. However, we now turn to the question time. Now, um, I will be canvassing questions and fielding them to you from sure. online, mm -hmm. and also if anyone in the in the audience has has a question. However, first, I, first I will, uh, as the chair, would like to ask you a question. Sure. And um, I believe that the question is in the hearts of most of of our audience. Many people who have studied or lived through the, the, um, the Marcos era is very will be very astounded to mm -hmm. now see that um, the Bong Bongs and Sarah Duterte team are such uh, are so far ahead. I know previously, Paul, you've worked on vote buying in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Can you? You've also mentioned that ten billion dollars was was stolen mm -hmm. during the um, the Marcos era. Could you see this as as a potential for why um, the uh, the um, Bong Bong team is so far ahead? 
Yeah, there's certainly very strong importance of money in Philippine politics. And uh, uh, one of the best ways to describe this is just the, the way that vote buying takes place ahead of the elections. And it is it, uh, with impunity and it is uh, quite out there uh, in the open. Uh, and it's uh, 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 practiced both at the local level and then up the ticket as well. In fact, one of the frustrations of people up the ticket is that they might be providing some money and then the local politician is engaged in vote buying and telling his, uh, his or her supporters, vote first for me, then uh, that for the mayor say, and then vote for the governor. And if you can vote for the congressperson, and then if you can, please vote for the president as well. But their, their primary priority is giving out money for, for local races. So huge amounts of money um, uh, flow in, in Philippine um, elections. Uh, and as I heard uh, the head of uh, the Commission on Elections say uh, at one point, um, we, we can't do anything about this. And he even joked that from our standpoint, it's like another conditional cash transfer. Uh, program and anti-poverty program. You know the money is 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 coming down. So that helps to explain um, the way in which uh, a lot of times issues are not that important. Uh, much more important is uh, pork barrel. Not not just vote buying. I'm glad you brought that up. But also uh, not not just vote buying, but also pork barrel as well as um, old-fashioned spoils, um, jobs for for supporters. So there's a lot of patronage, but there's always been at the same time a, a other important elements, and it's different, differentiated in the Philippines by uh, the terms uh, air war and ground war. Uh, air war is media campaigns that are most important for national races, like for the Philippine Senate. And the ground war, those for mayors and, and governors and the, all those counselors that I highlighted, uh, that tends to be um, ground war uh, territory. Now into this mix comes social media particularly since 2016. Uh, and the Duterte's um, uh, quite possibly with the help of the Marcoses because they got a lot of support from the Marcoses back in 2016, um, were the ones that really pioneered the, the role of social media. And it was critical in enabling this mayor of Davao to be the first president ever to be elevated straight from local office all the way to the presidential off to the presidential palace. So the uh, important point here is that uh, the, the social media was critical in 2016 and we are seeing it again with how the uh, Marcuses have uh, rehabilitated themselves. So all of that is important, the vote buying, um, but there's always been other elements as well, the media campaign and add that uh, you know, the radio and television, add on to that um, this very important role uh, at the, of, of social media uh, evident in 2016, 2022. Thank you. Um, move to the audience now. I'd, if anyone's got a question, ask them to stand up, announce themselves to the, to the audience, and then ask the question. Do I have to stand? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, Martin's Mar Mar my name. Look, fascinating. And um, in fact, I knew very little about that. This indictment on me, but also our whole system is a large country close to us, and we know nothing about it, for example. Mm -hmm. um, look, um, I'm fascinated. In our, our election is only four weeks away anyway. Mm -hmm. You're, the, the Philippines is three weeks away. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now starting to get some issues coming out in our campaign, some standing issues mm -hmm. prior to the policy releases. What are the big issues there? Is it is it um, all about families and personalities or are there key issues like strategy or economy or... Um, mm -hmm. defense or what, what, what's happening what's, what's it all about yeah um so um for all of the focus that i've i've put on um patronage appeals as well as the kind of showbiz element and that is uh, uh, found uh, in in the philippines and the social media appeals is not to say that issues are by any means absent so uh, one critical issue is uh, recovery from covid the philippines has been deeply scarred by covid uh, uh, some of the longest lockdowns in the world have been in manila uh, so it is uh, uh, affected the whole country. It's brought um, the economy 
economic growth down. And um, so I think uh, coming out of COVID, it's not, not gone away for all, as much as we often want to think it has, uh, but coming out of COVID and bringing economic recovery. COVID has also highlighted some major deficiencies in the healthcare system. Uh, and, um, you know, just saw in the, in the paper today that, you know, Sarah Duterte is saying that she wants to uh, bolster the universal health care system that was just um, put in place. And uh, it's, it's, it's very admirable on paper, but it has a lot of issues of, of funding. Um, the Philippine education system has been decimated by COVID um, with so many children that have basically missed out on a year or two of, of education. Uh, and uh, there are also um, uh, issues in the international sphere, but in general, foreign policy is not all that important in um, Philippine domestic politics. But um, there is um, it, it tends to be sympathy for the the fisher folk in the areas that are being harassed by the Chinese more than uh, concern over the the big uh, territorial um, claims that uh, China is making and how it has tried to push those so aggressively through its self declared. Uh, nine dash rule. Nine dash uh, rule. So, uh, all of those things are 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 there. Um, I could name some other domestic issues, uh, but would probably uh, highlight those in particular. Uh, and you know, the the economy, health, education, um, uh, and uh, just say that foreign policy is there, but it tends to be more more in the background. Very good. Heath? Uh, Heath McMichael, ACT branch president. Uh, when you spoke to us last time, Paul, um, I was struck by your comments about the, uh, the battle that uh, was being had between Duterte and the um, established media mm -hmm. and Rappler and uh, the lady journalist, I forget mm -hmm. her name. Uh, Maria, uh, Maria mm -hmm. who's had her uh, trials and tribulations mm -hmm. since, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe I could ask you to comment a bit more on uh, the air war and uh, the role and place of the established media in this campaign. Clearly, uh, the social media is uh, extremely important and dominating, but what is the role of the established uh, commentators in the media? Well, very important, of course, but uh, as we find throughout the world, um, there are, are, is a grand competition for information, uh, and it's so um, prevalent in our social media era, era for information that is uh, completely unverified, has no journalistic standards and uh, et cetera, to come out whether uh, through uh, Facebook or uh, other kinds of sources. So the, the media is there and it's strong, but just as in many other parts of the world, it doesn't have the influence that it used to because it's got the competition from uh, frankly, lots of dodgy uh, news sources that come out uh, completely unverified in the um, in, in social media. So uh, there are some important uh, news outlets that have continued to fight for press freedom. Uh, the one you mentioned is the most prominent, uh, Rappler, set up by Maria Ressler, who went on in late 2021 to get a much deserved Nobel Prize for all that she's done uh, to try to, uh, one, keep her operation in um, uh, from, from being shut down, um, but, but also to speak very, very eloquently about um, the dangers of social media and how it uh, could uh, ha has such potential to undermine uh, democracy as a whole. So uh, Rappler's been on the front line, but um, there was some danger to uh, the major newspaper, Philippine Daily Inquirer. They seem to have uh, weathered that. They're still going. Um, ABS-CBN, the uh, television uh, channel owned by the Lopez family. It was shut down by Marcos in 1972 and, and came back after 1986. Uh, Duterte shut down uh, ABS-CBN, or I should say the, the House of Representatives uh, did not renew their franchise. I think that was the, that, that's a more accurate way to, to put it. But, you know, very, very politicized effort to go after uh, independent news sources. Uh, what's remarkable after six years is that a lot of them are still standing and uh, uh, in a 
Robredo presidency would have the chance to, to, to resurrect. What's really scary, Heath, is to think about another six years of uh, a leader that uh, is not oriented towards uh, basic democratic standards of a free press and civil politi and political liberties and the like. Uh, so if we have six years of Marcos, particularly if he comes in with a huge mandate, uh, no Philippine president uh, since uh, 1986 has won with more than 42% of the vote. So if he comes in with more, he's got a mandate. Uh, and the damage to uh, democracy and to the press and to civil and political liberties is, uh, frankly, um, quite fri frightening to um, consider. Thank you very much. Amanda? Hi. Amanda Lynch, AWIA <coughs> councillor. And my question is one is towards Duterte's attitude towards China. Is this going to be a big shift with Bong Bong? Because I think mm -hmm. it was really hard to read where Duterte was standing with mm -hmm. China. Like it seemed like he was willing to um, be quite combative, but then he did deals as well. So yeah. it seemed quite. Um, complicated. And then just the, I just want to ask about climate change. Is mm -hmm. that an issue? There's so many natural disasters happening increasingly. Mm -hmm. in yeah, um, <laughs> let, me, let me take the, the um, second one first. Um, there is no uh, populous country in the world that is more disaster prone than the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we all remember uh, Typhoon uh, Haiyan from uh, 2013. Uh, there was another huge uh, typhoon, Odette, that uh, hammered uh, northern Mindanao through the Visayas all the way to Palawan uh, in the uh, west in um, uh, early, early in the year. Um, and then just this past week, there is um, uh, mudslides in the central Visayas. This is supposed to be the dry season. This is the hot season. To have these sorts of things happening now really shows uh, that, you know, how the Philippines and Australia and, lo and lots of other places are really on the, on the front lines of, of climate change. Uh, so that's never been a, a, a big issue for Duterte, who uh, never wants to talk with people about uh, moratorium on, on coal-fired plants or, or the like. Uh, one issue, interestingly, that is resurrected is uh, opening up the Bataan nuclear power plant that was mothballed, uh, that was first put, uh, uh, it was never in operation, but it was constructed uh, late in the Marcos years, uh, revelations of major major bribes um, in, involved in, in that. The, um, uh, so the, the issue of nuclear power has kind of come in. Um, but I think the Philippines uh, is, is a country that really sees itself as not causing the crisis and being a victim of the crisis. Um, so there are some very eloquent voices in the Philippines that um, go off to the, to the big meetings on, on climate change, whether it be Paris or Madrid or, or Glasgow, uh, and speak um, about the, the dangers. Um, I don't see it, I may be wrong, um, uh, I don't see it as a, uh, a huge issue uh, in the um, campaign in terms of uh, dealing with uh, uh, anything more than you know sort of mitigating the issues um so uh, that's on on um uh, climate change uh and your other question about china is is a very important one you're right that it's difficult to read the duterte administration on the one hand duterte gets up and he uh, says things that are very friendly to china he says that he wants to have an independent foreign policy um he heads off to Beijing, gets a lot of promises for infrastructure projects. Uh, one of his top cronies, Dennis Uwe, uh, is very close to China and has gotten a lot of, uh, of contracts. Um, so um, he's, he's close to China, uh, but at the same time, uh, there are a couple of breaks on things moving um, completely out of the, the historical tradition of um, uh, close 
uh, ties with the United States, and that is that both the Defense Secretary as well as the Foreign uh, Affairs Secretary uh, have uh, been very critical of China and what it's doing in the South China Sea. So that's that's acted to attenuate in many ways the Defense Secretary's former military attache to, to Washington, uh, but it, it's helped to counterbalance uh, what uh, uh, Duterte has has been uh, saying at least. Uh, and uh, in a, a recent speech to the General Assembly, he actually stuck to the script and he was incredibly critical of, of China. Um, so uh, it is um, difficult to read. What happens if Bong Bong comes in? Um, I, we have no idea who might be his foreign affairs secretary or who might be his uh, defense secretary. Um, but my hunch is that we wouldn't have those kinds of internal breaks. Um, that there would be a, a much greater tendency to um, uh, lead to a major shift in uh, Philippine foreign policy. As an overall observation, I think I can say that uh, Philippine politics has had lots of periods of turbulence um, through the de decades, but it was only in 2016 that Philippine domestic turbulence had foreign policy implications uh, with Duterte moving uh, to closer to China. And let's not forget Russia. Uh, he um, uh, went off to uh, Moscow in um, 2017. Uh, he has sp sp speak, spoken in the past very favorably of, of Vladimir Putin. He said he, said he is his favorite hero. Um, but if there's one important difference between these two uh, leaders, Putin and Duterte, it is that Putin grabs territory and Duterte has shown himself quite willing to give it away. Very good. Do you have a question? Hi there. Sorry, I had a quick question. Sure. <laughs> um, Joe Scavis is an ANU student. Um, I was just wondering, in regards to the development of um, state social media platforms, and particularly you can see with China in particular, um, that there's a quite advanced. Um, is that very, very dangerous um, for that to be something that is developed over the next six years in the Philippines? And how will that affect um, how information is disseminated um, on the social media platforms if there's a new platform created? Yeah, I, I don't know about too much about whether that has moved into the state realm, it's it's much more commonly. Uh, thank you for the question. Very good question. It's much more commonly in the shadows, uh, and it is uh, people who are uh, hired and um, they can get a lot of money as uh, influencers, influencers and the like, who are pumping out the kind of message that um, they are uh, encouraged to support. And it is exactly this sort of thing that is, is operates in the shadows that has been so important in the attacks on um, the so-called yellows, um, those who are uh, um, liberal party members, uh, with Lenny Robredo being the, the uh, first target of all. Uh, so I, I don't see much going, but there was a, an effort uh, early in the Duterte administration, seems to kind of petered out uh, in the presidential communications office. They were even coming out with their own tabloid for a while, but uh, haven't seen that go on. And that was uh, trumpeting the, the importance of the drug war and getting these people uh, off the streets and uh, uh, making the neighborhood safer. And, and one does need to highlight that uh, many aspects of this drug war uh, murders as it was, were also popular. Uh, it was not uncommon to hear people say that they felt like their neighborhoods were safer uh, because of these um, uh, rough elements that were no longer around. Uh, my own view is that um, that would be a very temporary kind of improvement to public safety and no way to try to deal with something as intractable as a uh, drug problem. Um, but uh, it was uh, uh, very much a uh, uh, policy that has uh, garnered significant support and that can't be denied. Susan Grace, um, I believe that uh, Filipinos abroad can vote um, mm -hmm. and they have a very uh, large diaspora. Um, yes. Would you be able to comment on that and whether that may be a, a factor in the election? Yeah, good question. So of the, the from my first slide where I spoke of 67.5 registered voters by memory, uh, something like by memory, 
I may be wrong, uh, one and a half million, two million uh, were overseas Filipino voters. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, an important development because you have uh, so many Filipinos that have had to go overseas um, to try to improve their, improve their lives. Uh, now, in reality, um, social media is also very important in reaching these overseas voters. So uh, it was overwhelming support from overseas voters for um, Rodrigo Duterte in, in 2016. And the message that he came out with about, you know, the oligarchs that have robbed our country and the like really does speak to people who've had to leave their families in order to go uh, earn a living. Uh, and they see that the system at home is stacked against them and they are, are very uh, uh, open to a message from a populist who says I'm, in, to, to quote Donald Trump, but uh, Rodrigo Duterte could say pretty much the same thing. I am on your side, right? So a sense that uh, he was going to be fighting uh, the battle for them. So the, they're actually of, of um, uh, in terms of, of voter outcomes, um, they probably don't a vote as a block all that differently, but given their uh, receptiveness to social media appeals, they came out very strongly for Duterte in the last election. And where they are right now, I don't know. I don't think there's any, I could be correct on this, but I don't think there's any, uh, it would be very difficult to do surveys of that. So I think we, we will learn that after the election. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Colin Maslin. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, talk. Um, to, uh, and just following on, I've got a question about the, I guess, the electoral system as well. How strong is it? How robust is the electoral system in the Philippines? And I'm thinking in terms of integrity and the degree of trust and confidence that, that the people have in it. How, how uh, susceptible would it be to no, uh, corruption and so on. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, the Commission on Elections in the Philippines is a, a body that's been around for a long time. It goes back to the American uh, colonial period. And I think we can say in the post-1986 period that it ha has had its ups and its downs. There's uh, certain periods where it is uh, under leadership that is uh, highly respected, uh, tremendous amounts of integrity, willing to take on the fights that need to be done for, for free and fair elections. Uh, and uh, I don't think we would say that about the, the current commission. It's, it's really shown some major divisions in, in recent months. Uh, at this point, almost all of the commissioners are appointed by Duterte. Um, a lot of them are his uh, old law school uh, classmates uh, or people from his home city, you know, very much uh, uh, close to him. And one thing that um, I really won't be able to um, assess until, until the election Elections, but it's something to watch is that this crony that I mentioned earlier, Dennis Uwe, who's um, uh, gotten uh, tons of uh, projects under Duterte and has um, acquired all kinds of uh, major, major resources, uh, companies and the like. Uh, he is the one, his logistics company is the one who will be moving the voting machines around the country. Um, that could be something that um, it really doesn't matter, that it's a sort of a quotidian task and it'll get done and uh, there's nothing to it, but I think it's something to, to watch in, in terms of uh, the potential for uh, uh, in you know, the, the races that are close that uh, Duterte is pushing for. But surprisingly, I'm gonna, gonna uh, kind of say something against what I've just said. Duterte has not played a really deep, interesting, in, in, uh, deeply interested role in a lot of the election outcomes. He's, he's, he's uh, once he didn't get uh, what he wanted, he's, he's sort of moved towards a more uh, laissez-faire stance. He comes out with these statements. I'm gonna tell you about somebody that's very corrupt. You just wait, I'm gonna tell you it's coming. But, you know, so it kind of leaves people hanging. Who, who, who are you talking about? And then he says, I, I think that uh, the next president should be a lawyer. And, and uh, the, the, the only one that's prominent who's, who's a lawyer is Lenny Robredo. Well, it's kind of unlikely he's going to be supporting Lenny, Lenny Robredo. So uh, listening to Duterte is a bit like reading tea leaves. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's, he's, uh, he's got, um, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, he's got an interest in who won, wins the presidency. I'm not sure how much he wants to be intervening in, in other races uh, at this point. So maybe the fact that his crony is uh, moving these voting machines around will have absolutely no impact. We'll see. Hmm. Yeah. Just building up a question off from online now and possibly off one of the previous questions about the Filipino um, diaspora, which is abroad. This is from Melinda Bobos online, a speculative question. Where would a miracle of a no return Marcos spring from? I grew up under martial law. Could you um, add on to that at all? Well, first of all, greetings, uh, Melinda, long time no see. Uh, very good that you're uh, uh, tuning in here. Uh, and uh, uh, where might the miracle come from? Uh, I would say that, first of all, is just the momentum that Robredo has through her rallies. She's got people who are coming out uh, and um, quite clearly are coming out of their own volition. Uh, she's got an amazing volunteer movement. Uh, and whether that um, might be able to catch on, there's a lot of Robredo supporters who really believe that they can prevail and they don't believe the pollsters. They, they just think that there's something else going on uh, and at the, at the grassroots. Keep in mind that the polling data, the most recent polling data that I showed was March and that came out in early April. The next poll, I'm not sure when it's going to be uh, coming out, but there is a there is a lag time. Uh, if uh, she has this growing momentum, we um, it, it should be evident, of course, in the in the next uh, poll. Um, the other uh, Melinda is the is the potential for uh, some some splits in the uh, Marcos Duterte camp. Um, there are some uh, elements in in Mindanao that seem to be. Everybody wants to support Sarah. You may have noticed I haven't talked about the the race with Sarah. I mean, I I I, I would bet a ton and a ton and a ton onward of money that she's going to win this election. I just can't see anybody uh, possibly coming coming close to her. But there's there's um, uh, talk of uh, sort of. Uh, because Filipinos can vote, the Philippine electoral system allows you to vote, you know, you pick, pick uh, one, one president from, from one uh, tandem and then vice president others. And another, some people have been pushing a so-called Rosa ticket, Rosa, Robredo and Sarah ticket. I don't know whether that might take off, but it highlights that there are some divisions in the, potentially in the Marcos um, uh, Sarah Camp. The other thing that could really build momentum, and I'm not making a prediction, but I'm saying that uh, if there's anybody that might withdraw from the race, I think it's likely to be Manny Pacquiao because he's got a close relationship with uh, Lenny Robredo. And if he uh, were to say, he's only got what, six or eight percent, something like that. But if, if there's momentum building for her, splits on the other side, he throws in uh, a, another, say, uh, six to eight percent, and also, just as importantly, creates a sense of momentum that brings some others along. Um, that, uh, Melinda, could be the makings of a miracle, but it is a miracle. It's not something that um, uh, I'm predicting. Mm -hmm. We'll go to one final question from the audience now. Thank you. Ernst Wilhelm, a member of the local branch. Uh, I'm amazed, and I think probably many others are also, uh, that there is, is in fact support for a member of the Marcos family. Um, I was in Manila in 1978 at an International Law Association mm -hmm. conference mm -hmm. and had a lot of contact with human rights organisations, yep. mm -hmm. uh, which were telling us about some of the repression, the yep. torture, mm -hmm. at some personal risk to myself, I was distributing a lot of leaflets giving examples of that, and it was quite horrific. Uh, we uh, became aware that the road from the airport into the city was bulldozed to remove the shanty tower yes, so uh -huh. it would look nice yes, uh -huh. for a major international yeah. conference. Mm -hmm. the, the Marcos regime was just awful. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about how it is that memories of that apparently have been forgotten? Is it because so many of the electors are young? Is it the influence of social media? Is it money? Um, why is there now this momentum for a Marcos family member? Mm -hmm. 
And if he were to go into come president, do you think that it would be similar to the father? Would be that would there be similar oppression, <laughs> torture, similar corruption, or would it be significantly different? Mm -hmm. Uh, very, very good question, and I completely share your characteriz characterization of the Marcos regime. I first arrived in the Philippines as a young man in 1980, so I, uh, that was the point just a couple years after you were there when the Marcos regime was really starting to show some uh, uh, bring up some some major uh, opposition. 1978 was when there was the um, elections that um, Benigno Aquino uh, was campaigning from from jail and um, getting a lot of support at that point. Um, the uh, human rights abuses um, became even more apparent uh, through the years, and uh, just uh, even even more. Uh, dramatic shift by the early 1980s was the crony abuses and how it was bringing down the, the economy. So yes, it is amazing. And I guess that's why I had the title Marcos. Again, uh, I, I too uh, have a hard time believing this, but we, we need to see it uh, again in the perspective of exactly the factors uh, factor you mentioned of um, that, that social media effort that is building up a completely new projection of the uh, Marcos uh, regime uh, on on BBC um, some some weeks ago, the BBC reporters, why are you supporting a former uh, dictator? And the the respondent said, oh, I have to object to that. He is not a dictator, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the the whole image of Marcos has has uh, shifted, particularly among uh, young voters, uh, and um, there's a. This uh, Washington Post article that I mentioned has, has a little video attached to it where there's a little game that the Marcos family has put on the social media uh, in which they uh, tell young people, uh, here is the martial law hymn, right? Um, go into your um, parents' um, house and play that hymn and see how they react, right? And then of course, take a picture of it, right? So um, the the mar martial law hymn, uh, uh, at least for those that get distributed, uh, the, the old people start marching and and getting and whistling and and singing the song and all and that's a sign to the young people of uh, you know some some uh, uh, authoritarian nostalgia uh, which again is all a part of you know rehabilitating the Marcos family so I am as absolutely as amazed as you are that all of this uh, has is happening. Um, but um, I, uh, I do think that the, the um, surveys are saying something. We all know that surveys are difficult in the in, in modern day uh, with uh, uh, mobile phones and the like. Um, I'm not saying that the surveys are uh, uh, likely to be you know 100 percent accurate in this day and age. But when someone is registering more than 50 percent and that's never happened uh, since the fall of Marcos, I think it does uh, tell us tell us something. Um, so um, I wish I knew the answer more 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 than that. Uh, the Marxists have been at this game and they've got a lot of money to put into the their rehabilitation and they've found that, opportunity um, through social media and all the tricks you can do on that. Well, thank you very much, Paul. It was a true tour de force listening to you go through the um, Philippine landscape for the upcoming election. Um, I, I appreciate you going through the stakes of what is coming up, you going through um, the, the backgrounds of many of the candidates and then also canvassing and oh, hearing a few questions from our audience. I also know personally enjoyed you taking me back to the classroom as in those nostalgic days. Um, we'd like to thank you and offer you a present Great. for kept attending twice here now and uh, thank you very much <laughs> and right. being such a good speaker. Right. However, our current president of the ATE branch would like to speak to us now about upcoming um, events in the future. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Uh, just to let uh, members know that uh, we're still working on our uh, May program. We're hopefully working in the selection season. We may hear from one or two of the candidates. Uh, office here in the ACT. Uh, we'll let you know more details as they come. And also we're working on a uh, meeting with the uh, Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Catherine Campbell, 
hopefully on the 18th of May, uh, we'll be in touch with members when that uh, turns up. Thank you. Thank you very much and see you next time. Thank you very much.